Greetings to you. I'm Andrew Baker. I'm a superintendent minister in Strathclyde. We're worshipping the living God together today. And I found a, a gem of a spot here in West Yorkshire. This is Pontefract Castle, the scene of much of English history, indeed British history. Good to be with you this morning. We worship God who was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. Amen. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign for ever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Journey through Revelation in worship and study in these last few weeks has blown our minds with its vivid imagery and dramatic language. We've been drawn to, to gasp at the wonder of this God, this God who will defeat evil and reveal the true character of goodness in a faithful people who are part of the company of the Lamb. So we're worshiping together the Strathclyde Circuit, the Methodist churches here, joining with folk all around the world. On this, the third in our series on Revelation. We have shared with the book's writer, John, in the vision of the ascended Jesus, in the letters of comfort and challenge to the churches. And we've been given a glimpse of the dramatic worship in the heavenly lamp realms. We've been introduced to the lamb who looks like it has been slaughtered. Of course, our minds have gone to the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Passover lamb and the blood splattered on the doorposts. In our worship today, we will recognize that God is in the business of exposing the powers of evil, that they might be defeated by the power of love. This is God's business every day in these challenging times. So it's good to be connected together. Some of you are going through very challenging times in your churches, in your families, in your nations. Today we recognize that God has not given up on God's church or God's world, and that this story of evil being defeated by goodness continues today. So, this is Pontefract Castle, and our son and his family live just a, a mile or so away from here. It is the site of some very gruesome stories, one of which is the slow starvation of Richard II in the dungeons of this very castle. Revelation in the flesh, the history of evil. Join with me in singing and be caught up in the worship of the living God. Glorious things of thee are spoken Zion city of our God.
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We worship you. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We worship you. Glory, glory, glory to the Lord, who was and is and is to come. We worship you. God of golden sash, God of trumpet and tears, God whose face shines like the sun, God of thunder and lightning, God of sunshine and rain, God who defeats every beast, and offers us to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. This living God, the Holy One, be praised and worshipped today and forevermore. Amen and Amen. Having been a maths teacher for eight years, I've always had a bit of a fascination with numbers. And it's been fun sharing with our granddaughter the significance of 64, my age, and the fact that it's two times two times two times two times two times two. Exciting, isn't it? Wonderful. The world of numbers. And the Bible is packed with numbers. Numbers which often have very symbolic significance. Revelation picks this up. As it picks up so many themes and and symbols of the scriptures. The number seven keeps on coming because the number seven is the complete number, the number that rounds everything up to completion. So we have seven churches, seven lampstands, seven stars, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven bowls. Six is the incomplete number. It's very incomplete if it's, if it's expressed three times. Six, six, six. And if each letter has a number connected to it, then the Emperor Nero Caesar's name has numbers which add up to 666. A code recognizing the damage done by Roman emperors. Three and a half is interesting too, being half of seven. And it goes with the 42 months, which you'll hear quite often, and the 1,260 days, both of which amount to three and a half years. Yes, you can see, I, I could get quite nerdy about all this. If you like, let the numbers add to the wonder and the shape and the mystery of this remarkable book. Today, as we read from some of the middle chapters, we're going to recognize the presence of the forces of evil. In these three and a half days, in these middle times between Jesus's first coming and his return in glory. Evil has its day. One day it will be defeated. And so the book of Revelation will give us some symbols of this evil. And we shall now just think for a moment of some of the evil which has sh caused a shadow over the history of our, of our world we share together. You'll have heard the saying, there's nothing new under the sun. It's actually from Ecclesiastes. 
Well, you can say that about evil. Evil seems to be as inbuilt within the human DNA as is the capacity to do good. This duality, if you want to call it that, in human nature, is recognised at the start of the Bible in Genesis, with the story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden and the fratricide of Cain and Abel, and goes on from there. You could say that the Bible is a historical record of evil events which happened to the people of God, but importantly, it records how they deal with it and counter it, and the involvement of God in that. So also in the time of Christ, evil was very real in the world with the atrocities of the Roman Empire on the Jews, and then as the Christian faith developed on the Christians. And so it has continued in the 2,000 years since. And it's usually about power, garnering power and wielding it, and doing everything necessary to hold on to it, including trying to destroy anything which would challenge it, and that includes faith. Well, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, which is an observation that a person's sense of morality lessens as his or her power increases. There are people who are consumed with a craving for control and who are willing to achieve it and to keep it, by whatever means necessary. So we could have a roll call of horrors, tyrants and murdering conquerors, Roman emperors, Caligula, Nero, Domitian, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, who is reckoned to have killed 11% of the world's population, Timur, who came after him, and then Ivan the Terrible in Russia after that. The murderous regime of King John in England, which led to the Magna Carta. Cromwell's horrors on the Irish. Robespierre's reign of terror in the French Revolution. Napoleon, Lenin and the horrors of the Russian Revolution. Stalin's reign of terror. Hitler, Pol Pot, etc., etc. And I'm afraid the organised church isn't blameless. There have been a fair number of murderous popes such as Alexander VI and the Borgias. The Eastern Roman Empire lasted for a thousand years after the fall of the Western Empire, but it was finally fatally undermined by the Crusades and the attacks led by the Roman Church. The repression of dissent such as the massacre of Béziers in 1200 at the behest of Pope Innocent III to quash the Cathars, a religious sect challenging the teachings of the Catholic Church. Kill them all, God will know his own. The horrors of the wars of religion in Europe in the 1500s, including the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre of the Huguenots, the French Calvinist Protestants, and then the massacre of the Waldesians in northern Italy, whose devotees sought to follow Christ in poverty and simplicity, but who were considered a challenge to the authority of the church. And so we could go on. Evil events which happen to the people of God. And, as in the time of the Old Testament, what's important is how we deal with it and counter it, and the involvement of God in that. Edmund Burke said that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph in the world is that good men do nothing. So we have a responsibility, and in that, we need God's strength and guidance. We need our rock.
gives us a record of some dreamlike characters which he sees in his vision, including some rather gruesome figures, dragon and, and beasts. We might think we recognise some of these dragons and beasts from the history of these islands. And perhaps we might even recognise some of these dragons and these beasts in our world today. And perhaps we might just connect with some of the powers of evil which seem to prevail in the 21st century. Oh Lord, save us. Spare us. Give us the grace we need. Sheila reads for us from the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. And I've extracted this reading from the reading of the whole book of Revelation put together by the Strathclyde Cir Circuit members, which you'll find on this channel. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 to 10. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on its horns were ten diadems, and on its heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave it his power, and his throne, and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have received a death blow, but its mortal wound had healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? and who can fight against it. The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all the inhabitants of the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slaughtered. Let anyone who has an ear listen. If you are to be taken captive, into captivity you go. If you kill with the sword, with the sword you must be killed. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So, we've heard of the beast coming from the sea, created looking like a, a leopard, looking like a, a bear, looking like a lion, and carrying a healed mortal wound. It's a blaspheming 
destructive creature. And it is worshipped by the bewildered inhabitants of the earth. John hears it as a call for the endurance and the faith of the saints, God's people. The presence of this evil is prompting God's people to a deeper, more committed, holy faith. I wonder if this beast can indeed be resisted. I wonder if the people of the earth have a real choice to make, join the beast or accept the consequences. I wonder if this is the decisive time for God's remnant, those who are prepared to receive the mark of God and not the mark of the beast. And the mark of God is that of sacrificial love, faithful living. Perhaps that mark will emerge on the remnant. I know it's all a bit scary and a, and a bit weird and we don't see beasts quite like this around in these days. But it seems to me as if the book is written in code to be understood by a persecuted, compromising, and complacent church in the first century. But perhaps it has a message for a declining, complacent, compromised church in the 21st century. A piece of writing which is warning that the embodiments of evil will have their day in every time and place. You see, the Roman Empire was overreaching itself and bringing destruction to those who would not tow the emperor line. Perhaps this is a warning to the compromised, complacent and persecuted church in every generation. The beast coming in different disguises. And in our day, technological, military power, will you have that mark on you? AI, artificial intelligence, used to imitate and steal identities? The mark of that beast? Financial cheating of others? The lie of the possibility of material things providing happiness? I guess you might be able to call the names of those who you can see have the mark of the beast upon them. Who have thought little of the preciousness of the lives of others for the sake of their own gain. Sometimes the mark of the beast has been seen in the church too. And that's why we're so committed these days to our safeguarding practices, to keep goodness safe. The beast, you see, feeds on a selfish greed that desires more and more and newer and newer and faster and faster. And if the beast is not destroyed, the beast will be the source of utter destruction of what is good and wholesome and loving and faithful. And when the beast has been on the rampage through history, concentration camps and gulags have been built. We have burnt at the stake and ransacked churches. We have enslaved other people. We threatened to fly those seeking asylum to another place. We have empowered bullies and looked the other way from injustice. The rampant beast. Watch out for the whisper of the beast in our mind, the ugly whisper, sometimes subtle, 
always looking to blame the other, especially the weakest, always justifying self-interest and a greedy spirit. This beast emerges from the chaos of the sea and we shall need to be strong to resist and to remain faithful. Only God's grace will grant us what we need. But remember, remember there will always be a remnant. Always be those who say no to the beast. Always those who remain faithful to the way of the Lamb. The story continues. And one day there will be a consequence for the beast. The company of the Lamb beckons us. It may not be easy. Here in Scotland, with our resources in the life of the church declining, God is seeking those who are ready and willing to align themselves with the way of faithful sacrifice. And then the victory of the Lamb awaits. How can the beasts be defeated in the world today? By the faithful, sacrificial Lamb. We cry to the Lamb. We cry to you for those whose homes and families have de been destroyed by war, by violence, by hatred, by fear. How can the beast of military might be defeated in the world today? We cry to the Lamb. We cry to you for those who have been damaged by their experience in the past of abuse, injustice, prejudice. How can the abusive beast be defeated in the world today? We cry to the Lamb. We cry to you for those who have walked close to the crime of genocide for those who experience racism, who are made to feel as strangers in the human family. How can the superiority beast be defeated in the world today? We cry to the Lamb. We cry to you for those fleeing persecution, torture and rejection for the victims of modern slavery and for those to whom they turn for help. How can the beast of cruelty and greed be defeated in the world today? We cry to the Lamb. We cry to you for those trapped in the prison of addiction, without the resources to be set free. How can the beasts of alcohol and drugs be defeated in the world today. We cry to the Lamb. We cry to you for those who are victims of the system of wealth creation and the consequences for prevailing poverty. How can the beast of owning more and more be defeated in the world today? We cry to the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. We join ourselves to the Lamb's task of victory through sacrificial love. Amen.
thanks for coming and sharing with me this day in worship from Pontefract Castle, the place where the beast has often rampaged in the past. It's a scene of clouds and sunshine today. It's a scene of calm and peace and the presence of the living God. Thanks for sharing in worship today and thanks to all those who have contributed. We have a hard journey ahead, but life has so much wonder and joy within it. The blessing of God, the God who was and is and is to come, the God who by the slaughtered lamb wins the victory over all that is evil, the spirit poured out upon us today, the blessing of this God be upon each of us. Amen and Amen.